you're here for our second panel, uh, Preservation and Identification. Um, I am uh, pleased to uh, introduce our panelists, but I just want to say that our uh, we have slightly changed the order of our panel and we'll be starting with David Pierce from the Library of Congress and then Alexis Ainsworth and then Tracy Gosal. So uh, I would, um, it is my pleasure to introduce archivist and historian David Pierce. Um, he is the Assistant Chief and Chief Operations Officer of the National, the Library of Congress uh, National Audiovisual Conservation Center. Uh, David is the author of the survival of, of the American, of American silent feature films for the National Film Preservation Board and co-author of The Dawn of Technicolor and also a book on the Technicolor feature, King of Jazz. He is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Academy's Science and Technology Council. Um, he also founded the Media History D Digital Library Project um, which, which we all know, and which is an invaluable resource for early cinema research today. Um, his paper is entitled Copyright and the Library of Congress. Thank you, Tammy. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to invite you in person to the uh, campus in Culpeper, Virginia, but we're glad that we can join you in this virtual presentation. Uh, so let's see if I can successfully share the screen. Um, so there are, yeah, there are a number of reasons uh, uh, that we're online, but we're very glad to um, have you here. This, um, I'm going to talk about the copyright process and how that has brought some materials into our collections. This photo shows a shelf in the copyright office that holds the original recordation books for the registration of copyrights. So long before things were online, they have these big bound volumes and they were entered in, information was entered in uh, by hand. So the basis of the film collections at the library is the copyright registration process. Some countries have um, a, a copyright library. When I worked at the British Film Institute, there was no mandatory copyright for motion pictures and the collections of the BFI uh, suffered as a result. But we've had many benefits at the Library of Congress for being the copyright library. Now the Patent and Trademark Office is in the Commerce Department, but the Copyright Office is part of the Library of Congress. And the reason for that is that the Copyright Office is the source for the collections, many of the collections that are in the Library of Congress. We don't have every book that's been published, but we certainly have enormous collections that are greatly enhanced by the materials that come in through copyright. Now, the registration of a copyright requires filling out a form, paying a fee, submitting two copies of the work, we'll talk about that later, and the submission of descriptive material. And we're gonna talk about that descriptive material uh, next. So if we open up one of the books like these that was used to register motion picture copyrights, we'll see something like this. There are thousands and thousands of these bound volumes. This one uh, up top, it says class L, photo plays, which refers to fiction films. Now, why were um, motion pictures class L? What did L stand for? Well, the copyright categories were assigned in order. So A was for books, B was for serials and magazines, skipping ahead a bit, uh, H was for reproductions of works of art, J for photographs, K for prints and pictorial illustrations. So when they wanted to add motion pictures in 1912, the next letter was L. And then M was used for motion pictures, not photo plays, which meant nonfiction films. And if you note the red circle at the bottom, that indicates a work for which the copyright was renewed. And the original book was pulled out and then annotated with the information on the renewal. Uh, let's look at this particular work. The record includes on the left, you see the eight zero, and then next is the date of receipt the number and the form of the copies. Um, so this particular one says 71 prints, clippings from real. That does not mean, mean 71 prints of the film. That means 71 uh, frames from the film. And then it has the uh, uh, title and author. 
uh, three rings and a goat, and then the name and address of the copyright claimant and indicating whether the work is published or unpublished. Now, that descriptive material has been part of our collection since the films were registered for copyright. And uh, the, it accompanied the film print. Uh, last year, our manuscript archivist published a very lengthy 3519 page finding aid. In addition, the collection is searchable by title, and we have PDFs online for all of the films up through 1926. And in January, we'll add the films from 1927 as those go back, go into the public domain. So these copyright descriptions are, were submitted as part of the copyright process and we're now able to make those available. So here's the description for Three Rings and a Goat, which I found on our website. Uh, this one happens to be a plot synopsis. Now, if you see at the top of the page, the copyright mark of a C in a circle, and then it says L6780, and in the book on the left, 6,700, and below that, 80. So we can keep track of the films and the, the documentation submission using the registration number. The printed descriptive material that was deposited with the Copyright Office varies. Is sometimes it's a synopsis like this. Other times it's cast and credits scripts, cutting continuities, press books, etc. cetera. Uh, Theta Bear's Cleopatra is an early script, for example. Uh, it's a great variety of reference material that often isn't available anywhere else. And it's now all online. Now, that material had been microfilmed and we were able to digitize the microfilm and relatively easily put it online. But we have other copyright material that was not microfilmed and is not online. And I'm going to describe those materials next. At some point, the newsreel descriptions were taken out of the collection of copyright descriptions and filed separately. So they weren't microfilmed and they aren't on our website, but they are cataloged and available for researchers in our reading room in Washington, DC. Digitizing this material is a high priority. This uh, newsreel uh, descriptions is an enormous uh, collection and very comprehensive. Uh, most of you are familiar with the paper prints that were submitted for copyright registration. I'm not going to talk about those here. Alexis will be discussing those next. But some producers realized that they didn't need to submit the entire film in order to get copyright protection. The paper, that brings us to the paper print fragments. Producers would print on paper, just as would the paper prints we're familiar with, but just one image for each scene or intertitle. That was sufficient for copyright, and I guess it must have been cheaper or more convenient. It certainly is not so great for us, um, but you can see it's the same paper prints, um, same kind of paper, same kind of uh, resolution. But uh, here is an example attached to uh, this, this uh, stiff paper. So the res this results in this submission for L category, unpublished The Victory of Virtue from 1915, and I cut out the copyright registration information. Uh, you'll see that copyright entry refers to title, description, and 152 prints. The 152 prints refers to the photographic prints that you see on the screen. And thanks to Bucky Grimm for the photos of that. And not all of the submissions were on paper we received a fair number where the distributor clipped a nitrate frame for each scene in the film. This particular one is from an Italian import, The Lion of Venice, distributed by George Kleine. In the upper right corner, you see that there are a total of 99 scenes, which we would call shots. And this sheet has scenes 61 to 80 and is sheet number four. This photo was taken this week by our nitrate vault leader, George Williman, and you can see the staples haven't been touched since 1914. This registration lists title, description, and 198 prints, of which there are 20 on this page. So, I, and now we have a second example uh, from the Jeffries and Sharkey fight uh, from 1899. The authorized version was photographed by Biograph. So Sigmund Lubin staged and photographed his own version. You see stamps on the right from the original envelope that contain this uh, notebook. 
that indicate when this was received by the Copyright Office. The pages of the book look like this, where each scene is represented by some frames neatly stapled onto a card. And on the left side, you can see the results of the glue holding the card to the bound volume. And here's a close up of the frames complete with the original staples. So there are a lot of treasures in our collections, which uh, many people are not aware of. And the purpose of this presentation was to uh, let you know about them and encourage you to reach out to our reference librarians who um, are the, uh, one of the best entry points into our collections. Uh, now, the Motion Picture Copyright Descriptions Collection, that's the PDFs of the descriptive material that was sent in, so for Class L, photo plays, fiction films. From 1912 to 1926, we have nearly 23,000 PDFs online. For Class M, Motion Pictures Not Photo Plays, meaning nonfiction, from 1916 to 1926, we have um, over 1,900 PDFs online all searchable. You're searching by the metadata on the file. You're not searching the content of the file. And all of the files can be downloaded. Uh, there are roughly 3,000 paper prints. Alexis will be talking about those in detail. The paper print fragments cover the very early 1896 through 1915. And we have nearly 2,500 uh, works that are represented by paper print fragments. They don't always look like, all of them don't look like the example I gave. Um, but that was representative of the collection. For the newsreel descriptions, we have 50,000 pages, goes from very early through the 1960s. And the booklets with nitrate frames, we have perhaps uh, 75, maybe 100 titles um, where we have that material. And those are stored in our nitrate vaults because those are nitrate uh, frames. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide this overview. And I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic and great to have all of this information and these different uh, accounts of these different. Uh, so I'll have more questions for you after. And, and people can feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Um, during the talks. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our second speaker, Alexis Ainsworth. She's a graduate of George Washington University's Program in Museum Studies, and she is the Moving Image Cataloger at the Library of Congress National Audiovisual Conservation Center, uh, where she has worked with the paper print collection for over a decade. And her, uh, the title of her paper is The Paper Print Collection at the Library of Congress. All right. Uh, it looks like, uh, David, you need to stop sharing so I can... Uh, you're going to have to take it back. I'm on so many different screen. Oh, there's meeting control that I'm. Oh, oh, maybe it's over here. Let me try. Ah, there we are. Thank you. There. Success. Fantastic. All right. Uh, so I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, my name is Alexis Ainsworth. Uh, I am a moving image cataloger at the National Audiovisual Conservation Center. Um, and they asked me today to talk about a collection that I've been working on for, I hate to say it, a decade. <laughs> um, but uh, cataloging it, I've, I've been able to learn a lot about its uh, quirks and its history. Uh, so first off, we got to talk about what is a paper print. Uh, most often, it's a motion picture that has been contact printed onto 35 millimeter wide paper. So essentially, as you can see by the images, it looks like a reel of film, but it's on paper. Uh, in the collection there, they can be anywhere from 10 feet to 5,000 feet. Um, and as David said, we have around 3,300 complete films and then around 2,500 fragments which uh, fragments, like David said, means uh, it's more that they just submitted a part of the film, not necessarily uh, the rest has been lost to damage. Uh, so the collection contains motion pictures that were submitted for copyright in the United States between 1894 and 1915, about kind of dwindled off around 15. 
Um, so as we've kind of discussed, uh, early motion pictures, uh, were, we were unable to copyright them at the time because the law did not yet recognize them. Uh, piracy was rampant and filmmakers were desperate for a way to protect their works. So they had to get a little bit crafty. Um, and at that time you could copyright a photograph. So essentially a real film is a series of photographs. So what if we printed it on paper and sent it in? Um, cross your fingers and hope the copyright office says, okay. Uh, so that is what happened. Uh, so we started receiving paper prints for the copyright deposits and um, started off on this wonderful journey. <laughs> uh, so um, what did they send in? Um, generally the, the requirement was two copies of the paper print. Um, and this is one of my favorite photos uh, provided by Dan Striebel of um, what that can look like. Here we've got the Gans Nelson contest uh, from 1906, and we've got two gigantic paper prints uh, that is not the average size. Most of them are a lot smaller, um, but this kind of shows you how we generally get the two copies. Um, a little bit later, you had the option to submit uh, your work as unpublished, which meant that you only need, needed to send in one copy. Um, so while it's easier on the producer, it's a little bit sadder for us because we don't have another copy to go to if the first one is damaged or just looks horrible. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, Melia has actually submitted four copies of some of his titles. Uh, two were under the English title and through Star Films, and two more were under the French title and from Melia's. Uh, we don't quite know if there's a difference between those two different copyright submissions, um, but I'd love to know if there is. <laughs> so we've already talked about in previous presentations, uh, the Edison's Kinetoscopic Record of a Sneeze from 1894, which is uh, the earliest surviving motion picture copyright submission. So essentially uh, 45 frames that uh, represent the changing world. Uh, the, the copyright submissions could come in in various formats. Um, as David kind of demonstrated, some of them are just single frames. Some of them are sheets of paper. Some look like reels of film, but on paper. Uh, Edison would actually switch to submitting a lot of his work on 35 millimeter wide paper with sprocket holes. And he was notorious for using very cheap flimsy paper that uh, is just a delight to work with. <laughs> So here's where we get into the question that I don't really need to answer for all of you guys. So what else is in there and why should we care? <laughs> um, so basically this, this collection really is a gem of the library because it illustrates the evolution of the mo motion picture and essentially how we learned how to convey a story with a camera. It documented American life and attitudes and even attitudes about other communities as well. And it provided a passive way for, through the copyright process, to collect and preserve the works of early influential filmmakers. And um, copyright was great for uh, kind of eliminating that curator bias that you can have when you're going out there and selecting what to add to the collection. This, it was just send it to us and, and we'll keep it. Um, so within the collection, I've already mentioned, we've got a lot of Edison's works, uh, as well as Biograph, those are two of the big ones. Um, a lot of work from Mary Pickford and D.W. Griffith. Um, as far as genres, we run the gamut. You've got your actualities, some comedy, some drama, uh, trick photography, um, and then your short films and your feature films. Um, one of my particular favorites is the actualities, which document a lot of events. Um, we, it's sadly, we've got for President McKinley, <laughs> we've got both his inauguration and his funeral. So kind of documenting his entire run as president there. Um, but also I, the, the picture I included here is one of my favorite subgenres uh, is we have a lot of films of World's Fairs. Um, and so here we've got the Electric Tower at the Pan American Exposition in 1901. Um, I love these films because they document a lot of temporary architecture from a beautiful time in you know, our artistic expression uh, through you know, architecture and whatnot. And a lot of those were temporary structures that uh, were taken down afterwards. So a lot of these are just beautiful for the, the capturing of that art. 
So as, as, as has been discussed, the, the law was amended in 1912 and uh, filmmakers were allowed to send in their works on nitrate. Uh, the unfortunate thing about that is the Library of Congress did not have the ability to store nitrate at that time. So we were forced to return the prints to the depositor. Uh, and this led to a sad occurrence with one of the famous lost films, London After Midnight, uh, we have record that two prints were sent to us and uh, we looked at them, said, yep, that's good, and sent them back to MGM, keeping only the paperwork. So if we had paper prints of those, they might still be around. So, you know, if only. <laughs> so let's get into the rediscovery of the paper prints. So oop, let's get back to where we were. There we are. Um, the... After the law was changed, we slowly stopped receiving paper prints and it kind of became a stagnant collection. It wasn't active. It was kind of put in a back room and some say it was completely forgotten about. Others just say it was neglected. Um, regardless, Howard Lamar Walls was a copyright clerk that worked at the, uh, in the copyright office in the early 1940s. And he was really the first advocate for the collection, uh, responsible for some of the early inventories and pushing for the preservation of the collection. And as we see, we've got Howard here, but also we've, we've seen some pictures of what the paper prints originally looked like. And this one on the right looks a little scary, but I promise they, they all look better now. So some of the fun stuff about this collection is there's definitely some peculiarities. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the paper print version of the work can often differ from what we know to be the released version of it. Uh, sometimes this is because the paper prints were made early in the editing process. Um, so you might have longer scenes or different cuts of scenes or maybe in a different order. Um, it just, just don't expect it to, to look, don't have any expectations. That's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> and uh, kind of like with the, with the fragments, you need to keep in mind that it might be a fragment. It might not be the complete film. It might just be a small portion of the film. Um, and another big thing to keep in mind is uh, in the 1960s, uh, we were able to preserve the entire complete collection of the paper prints uh, through a partnership with the Academy uh, and working with a gentleman named Kemp Niver. Uh, he was able to transfer all the complete films to 16 millimeter, but he was not always faithful to the original material. Um, if he had access to better source material than the paper print, he would use it. But he would still put on the titles that it was made from the paper print. So we've got a 16 millimeter of Sarah Bernhardt's uh, Queen Elizabeth. I'm not going to attempt the French title because uh, my French is horrible. Um, but our paper print of it looks horrible. It is very dark and practically unusable. Yet the 16 millimeter looks great, gorgeous, and just happens to have different inner titles. So it's very obvious that there was different source material, but he did not note it, and we don't know what that was. So just keep in mind, it's a little weird. Um, so one of my favorite examples of how the paper print can differ from the release version of a film is Those Awful Hats from Biograph in 1909. So in this comedy, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, uh, we're seeing an audience watching a film on the screen and women come in with comically huge hats. So in the release version, what we're seeing here is actually a screen grab from a Black Hawk re-release of this film. Um, but so what we see is the audience watching a film on screen. In the paper print, we see the audience in front of a blank screen. Uh, but also separately, we see just the film that they are watching on screen. So the paper print was made before those two pieces were married together. Um, so we've gotten occasional preservation requests for this paper print and we kind of have to warn them. It's like, this doesn't look how you think it looks. <laughs> Um, some more things to think about if you want to uh, use a paper print for preservation or uh, use it for research. Uh, the print quality might not be great. Um, since these were a copyright deposit, uh, a lot of the filmmakers didn't see this as potentially being the only way was, their work survives. It was just get it on paper and get it in so we can get the, the law to protect us. So uh, as we see on the right here, we've got some, uh, a really dark half of the image and the other half is fine. Again, it's, you know, they just didn't care about the results. And also printing on paper was not exactly an easy thing. Everybody had their own methods. Um, so, you know, 
the results are scattershot. Um, also, copyright labels that were put on by our own people <laughs> often co cover the opening frames. Uh, so this means we're, we're losing a couple of frames, um, but I will argue this, this information is very important for the identification of the paper print. A lot of them don't have any titles of any kind. So this copyright information is really all we have to uh, apply a title to this work. Um, we are able to remove those labels with the help of our conservation division, but it's just something that takes time and effort. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that many of the reels are missing footage at the head or the tail because the ends have not been secured over time, or if they were, the, the tape gave way. So that means it's been bouncing around, it's been rehoused, it's been used, pieces were lost. Um, so we actually have a couple of paper prints that this has happened to that are unidentified. We truly don't know what they are because all the information is missing. Um, so yeah, it's delightful and fun. <laughs> um, so all these preservation efforts really run into our main goal at the library, which is to make our, our items available to the public. And the main way that we can do this is through the National Screening Room. So this is my little plug. Um, the National Screening Room is a wonderful portal to the moving image collection at the library. And um, via the, the, the screening room, we can stream films worldwide, and you can also download uh, most of them for your own use. And it's got more than just a paper print collection, but I don't really know why you'd venture away from it because it's so great. Um, <laughs> so up here, I have some examples. Uh, another one of my favorites, similar to the World's Fair films, is the Coney Islands films. So a lot of pretty lights. Um, so that's it for me. Um, special thanks uh, to, especially to Aaron Palombi and Megan Polly, who are two of my cohorts at the library. Um, they work a lot on the collection with me and I, I couldn't do my work without them. So thank you. Oops. Thank you so much, Alexis. And uh, uh, please say hello to Megan, who was my undergraduate student here at UW Milwaukee. Yeah, it's really great to know that she's working with you and and working on uh, um, the collection. I'm really yeah, it's great. Uh, so um, thank you for uh, for that, and I'm uh, pleased to introduce our third and final panelist on this uh, panel. Um, uh, so uh, Tracy Gossel is the founder and president of the LA-based Film Preservation Society, dedicated to the restoration and conservation of silent films, including Double Trouble from 1915, Mr. Fix-It from 1918, uh, additional films from the 20s, The Three Musketeers, Too Many Kisses, and particularly the Biograph Project with MoMA and Library of Congress. Uh, she has published numerous articles on silent film history, and she is the author of The First King of Hollywood, a uh, bio biography on Douglas Fairbanks. Uh, the title of Tracy's uh, presentation is The Biograph Project, a joint endeavor with the Library of Congress, MoMA, Film Preservation Society, and multiple other archives. So, well, thank you so you. much. Thank you for uh, including me today. I think the reason I was uh, asked by David Pierce to submit um, a little uh, proposal for a talk was because talking about the Biograph Project is showing how all of these wonderful things that the, you archivists have assembled and gathered and put together, when the rubber hits the road, this lets us actually reconstruct um, the things that happened in the distant past so that we can see them the way people saw them back then. Biograph Project, we're on about year five of a 20-year project, which is to restore um, all 450 films that Griffith directed for the Biograph Company between 1908 and 1913. We argue that this is probably the best demonstration of the um, evolution from film stage play to what we truly consider to be cinema today. We're trying to 
uh, scan the best available material from multiple sources. Um, there are times when we do not have original intertitles um, and we have to, in a sense, reconstruct them with the Griffith voice, but some good heavy digging and research often permits us to find uh, original air titles where others have not. And then we're looking and working with digital tools to return the image to their original release date. So if you look here on the left, this is from the Court of Life, which um, until the Biograph project started was only thought to exist as a uh, paper print. And uh, we, ended up acquiring it from a 35 millimeter from a private collector. And it was pretty much pristine, except for uh, a few feet during this early scene. And you can see digitally how, how uh, we restored it to what it originally was. And then this is to the right is a Mary Pickford um, biograph called The Awakening with Arthur Johnson. And this is on the left, the material that MoMA had from its 35 millimeter camera negative and fine grain positive. And again, you can see there are issues with it and we are bringing it back uh, to the way Billy Bixer would have wanted uh, to see it. You all have heard enough about paper prints. Um, you don't need to, to hear about it again, um, but know that the paper prints were our source material for every single 1908 film. All the 1908s are lost. We only have paper prints. Um, we, of course, uh, are extensively using the material at the Museum of Modern Art. They do not have all of the negatives, but they have the majority of the negatives. And we are sort of uh, skipping amongst many other archives to get the onesies and twosies. Um, uh, the light that came, for example, only exists as a paper print at LOC and a very damaged and crumpled 35 millimeter at George Eastman um, Museum. After two years of their labs working on it, we finally got a good scan of the 35 millimeter. Uh, Mary Pickford had purchased back many of her biographs in the um, uh, 1920s. She didn't want them seen um, and they were deposited ultimately um, as a donation with the Library of Congress before her death. A lot of those Pickford biographs had been reissued and re-edited and stretched into two reelers um, in the teens and 20s. Um, and odds and ends, uh, apart from the Pickford uh, donation, exist at uh, LOC. And of course, their paper prints but I, I cannot um, emphasize enough the value of finding those strange, eccentric, wonderful people who have storage lockers full of 35 millimeter and they're not even temperature controlled. But if you can pry some of those um, reels out of their hands, we ended up finding uh, several films that nobody had, MoMA didn't have, or um, if MoMA had material on them, it was badly degraded, and we were able to, to get it from, from private collectors. So God bless the private collectors. Lots of challenges. As I mentioned, um, inner titles were missing uh, for essentially almost all of the 1909s. Occasionally, a paper print will have inner titles. Um, the material we get when it's in 35 is in uh, shooting order or tinting order, not in the final assembly order. And as was already mentioned um, uh, by uh, Alexis, the paper prints are not always in the actual final correct order themselves. Um, the pandemic didn't help when we were ready to finally start getting shipments of 35 millimeter material, that's when everything shut down. Um, getting paper prints from Library of Congress isn't uh, as easy as one would hope because they are rightly very um, uh, careful with material that is already damaged or uh, possibly 
would tear in the scanning process. Um, there was a shortage of the special Japanese rice paper that they needed to repair tears. And then there was a period where um, they were investigating a better glue. And all of this has resulted in several of our restorations that are just waiting for one or two missing shots where we've got the 35 on almost everything um, are being held up by us waiting for the uh, paper prints. And then all those 1908 films and God bless the paper print rolls at LOC, but um, getting a scanner that works and um, uh, getting people to sort of police the scanner, the material as it goes through the scanner is very uh, time uh, and resource intensive. And it's a challenge for LOC who has a lot of other things for those people, people to be doing. And finally, there's the issue of politics. If this archive doesn't like that archive or if somebody um, is feeling possessive of their material or they think you're making the stuff look too good or they plan on restoring it themselves someday. Um, it can be a real challenge to uh, sometimes to sweet talk the material out of people, even though we're doing all the work and funding all the restorations. Um, people still feel often possessive of their material. I'm happy to say that is not the case with the Library of Congress, who has been just gloriously wonderful um, to work with, and um, not so much the case with private collectors. If you cross their palms with gold, they will give up their precious reels. So I'm going to uh, share a single film, a narrative of how we restored a single film to um, to give you an example of the challenges and the rewards of the Biograph Project. So 1912 is near the end of Griffith's tenure at Biograph. He's a very mature filmmaker by 1912. That's the year he's, he's making such miraculous films as uh, Musketeers of Pig Alley and um, others that we all know. But um, when A Cry for Help was screened at the Griffith project at Cordonone about 20 years ago, um, David Meyer's essay on the subject in the BFI book said, there's probably too little remaining of uh, the film A Cry for Help to, to reconstruct an intelligible version of this improbable rescue melodrama. And that is because only 500 feet survived and they were in the original shooting order. Um, so you sort of had take after take of Lillian Gish on the telephone and fainting, but it, it to figure out, um, it was like reading a chapter of Huckleberry Finn with the word scramble. Uh, however, we were very lucky that there was 337 feet um, of footage that was in 16 millimeter um, in a fragment of a flicker flashbacks that um, had come out around 1943. And that was kept at the Royal Belgian Film Archive. And God bless them. They were wonderful about sharing with us. And then 17 shots remained missing. Now, how did I know that 17 shots were missing? Um, I'll get to that in a second. I do want to show you the challenges of dealing with uh, sort of a 16 millimeter version of a shot versus the original 35. In this scene, Lionel Barrymore, as the poor um, homeless tramp, had asked somebody for some money, and they very um, uh, snidely walked past him and wouldn't give him the money. And in this scene, he looks down at his hand, and then he turns his hand over to show us that it was nothing. He didn't get any coins. But if I only had the scene from the Flickr flashback, I would just have Lionel Barrymore looking down and we wouldn't see that little bit of action and we would be losing some meaning um, from that scene. So we worked with what we had whenever we had the 35, that was what we would use. But I just wanted to show you the, the gains and losses uh, that come with getting material that's sort of secondhand. Then um, 
the reason I knew specifically the number of shots that were missing was because it was after the summer of 1912, we did not have a complete paper print to work from. Instead, we had the copyrights as already discussed earlier that were submitted with the shot per shot description of the scenes. And then, um, God bless them, the, uh, included the wording, the exact wording of the inner titles. So we knew what the inner titles said which we often don't, and we knew exactly where the inter intertitles lived. Um, for those missing shots, because we didn't have the paper print, we did have um, the first two frames of each scene. And so for the missing uh, 17 shots, we were able to sort of pan and scan across the, um, the frames that we did have to show at least what the image was going to be like. For the most part, this was a great way to communicate what was going on. Um, in a few instances, you had just empty um, scenery and there was going to be a horse rushing into the scene or people were going to come into the scene. But the first two frames are just you're, you're looking at, you know, a garden and it wasn't very helpful. Um, finally, uh, we knowing where the shots live, uh, the intertitles live, is not the same thing as knowing how long the intertitles run. We want the footage of the final film to match the release footage uh, exactly. And fortunately, at the Museum of Modern Art for these later films, the business records show us the um, not only the intertitles, although not the placement, but it shows the number of feet that were devoted to each intertitle. And that gives me a few minutes to um, show you just a little bit of a cry for help because I know in four minutes, it's time for the um, uh, Q and A. So you can see as soon as it opens, and I apologize, I have a, a small puppy behind me who's decided this is time to whine. Um, here we go. Uh, I'm going to just start the film uh, here and you can get a view of, you can start seeing how we're putting different little pieces together to bring it together as best we can. Thank you. 
And I would like to thank my co-presenter, Theodore, um, for his silence during the majority of my talk. Thank you very much, Tracy uh, and uh, Alexis and David. So we can uh, now, if you'd like to come back on, on screen, we, we will begin. Our, we've got uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a, a, just a kind of question for all of you, because I, I, was, I just found all of your talks fascinating. And um, David, you were talking about uh, some of the things that you mentioned about, about fragments was so interesting. And um, the fact that just one image of, or of, for each scene or intertitles would be deposited. And then Tracy, you mentioned that the intertitles were often missing in what you were looking at, um, along with you know the difference in shooting order versus assembly order, which we learned from Life of American Firemen that you know things weren't shown consecutively, but actually were, were most likely simultaneous. But but that the the deposit was simul was uh, uh, consecutive. Um, and Alexis, also you 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 raised that question of of you know the difference between these different between the versions between the paper prints and the films. So my question is kind of general in, in you know what accounts for these differences in your views? Um, at what point in uh, the production were filmmakers depositing, typically, you know, depositing uh, these materials? And also, I just want to, um, there were two, I just came from Women in the Silent Screen Conference where uh, um, uh, Elif from I uh, Film Museum and, and uh, Amsterdam, Alif Kanaki Ronja, and she she showed us. Uh, we, we looked at Around the Corner, a, sc a screenplay by Frances Marion from 1921, and she showed how side by side these reconstructions were different, but also the angles were different. The two versions, the angles or the proximity of the camera was different, but it was the same action. And so, you know, we had to ask: Were they different cameras or? Or were these taken from different sources? So I'm curious about that. And I also want to point everyone's attention to, uh, again, our screening program from the Library of Congress, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you, David, so much for getting us these prints. Um, and the first and fourth film on that list, which you can now go and see on the, the um, Henry platform of the Cinémathèque Française or on our um, link through our website, uh, Pruning the Movies, by Nestor and censorship and its absurd absurdities. Censorship and, and its absurdities is only intertitles, which blew me away. And they're intertitles that were uh, about censorship. So it's a really interesting film. And we were all asking, where did these intertitles come from? Were these the ones that were cut or were they, um, you know, it was really an incredible film and comedy. Uh, so I, you have to go and see this film. It will blow your mind. I promise everyone, uh, you must see these films and definitely, especially pruning the movies and censorship and its absurdities. But yeah, so my question is, uh, what accounts for these differences in your view? Or what are some of the things that you, you found to be interesting about the differences? Or what can we learn from, from these differences? Well, I know David has given a fascinating talk in the past, so he's probably better to address this about the a and B camera that were used for uh, domestic versus international. And often when you're reconstructing things, you may only have the material from the foreign or the B camera. So I will yield to David on that question. Oh, David, you're muted. David, you're muted. 
All right, thank you. Um, well, we're all probably familiar with how the Melies company was running uh, two cameras, uh, which has allowed Serge Bromberg to present some of those films in 3D. But the really, uh, it appears as if most films were produced off a single negative and prints were shipped overseas, at least in the early days. And I have uh, examples from, I think, Flying A of, you know, photographs of here are all the prints of our new William Russell film that are, you know, being, being shipped to Europe. So I think the, the variant versions uh, didn't come in until a bit later. But of course, what we have are with some of the paper prints and the unassembled negatives that Tracy's describing is kind of snapshots of the films as they were um, in process and not necessarily the final release version. And then in the archive, sometimes we will have reissue versions, as Tracy was saying with the Mary Pickford films that were reissued, or um, simply what survives was reworked in a different form, you know, or got smashed up in a projector. So it is a challenge to, to back out what the changes are and to return something to its original form. And that's where the work of our archivist team you know, examining prints and looking for splices and changes in, uh, uh, you know, film stock, all that, provide some of the clues, but not necessarily all of the clues. Pass it off to Alexis or Tracy. I can tell you, uh, it was inexplicable to us, but when we were restoring um, the half-breed and had different source material, we were expecting um, there to be a possibility of uh, sort of identical shots, but taken from a slightly different angle, A and B camera thing. But what we found was there would be shots of the identical action that were clearly different takes. Um, Fairbanks had on a Davy Crockett hat and sometimes the tail of the hat would blow certain ways. Um, also in some of the versions there were uh, closer shots used in the action and in for the exact same scene they were using a longer shot and I I can't explain that uh, unless Triangle um, the the reissues that Triangle was doing they were sometimes just pulling from different uh, source material and you would get these S.A. Lynch prints um, that were slightly later than the original Triangles and then all the reissue companies on uh, Triangle that maybe they just went back to the original source material and put in a different take. I can't, I can't understand it, but it was really interesting. Yeah, all I can say about that um, is really, uh, as a cataloger, I'm, that I'm just looking at the physical item and trying to learn what I can from it and put it in my record so you guys know what you're getting. Um, so a lot of that is just assumptions from the, the physical item. So, you know, the, the issue with those awful hats, you know, it definitely seems like it's early on in the editing process. Um, we've seen some other paper prints where there's a longer version of the scene than the released version. So we assume that they just cut it down for the eventual release. Um, but our, our job as catalogers is more to tell you what it is so that you have uh, all the information you need to you know, figure out the, the truth behind it all. By the way, we're very excited about those awful hats because the movie within the movie was filmed by moving the camera way back and, and just sort of filming the upper right, having the biograph stage on the upper right of the scene. Um, and the original 35 millimeter also looks like that. You have the, the scenes in the theater with the white sheet where the film's going to be, and then you've got the movie within the movie being filmed. The trouble is on the 35, some of the movie within the movie is terribly degraded. And those of us who saw Blackhawk prints of it back in the 70s are too young. Um, you remember seeing it that way, but we're going to scan the paper print, not for the whole film, but merely for those portions of the movie within the movie that are degraded and then digitally do the, the reconstruction the way they had done. David, you can probably better describe the, the printing that they did to combine two uh, film sources to make it look like um, one. Okay, well, I'm gonna, so maybe I can wrap, maybe you can answer that, but 
along with this other, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, it's so fascinating. And yeah, Ellie showed these side by side because sometimes you wouldn't notice these differences and they were so stark. She showed the differences in the restoration between the two versions. It was just mind blowing really. Um, it's, so, so we have a question and it also, I'm gonna tie it into another, it kind of connects and it also uh, ties into a burning question that I have as, as about the transfer process from the paper prints to film. Because how does that get from, how do you take these paper prints and then print them onto celluloid? What, um, and how does that even, work. <laughs> um, but it, it seems like magic. Um, but so I want to also bring in the question that from our from our uh, Q&A, Shiraz Bathena asks a similar question um, for Alexis or really for anyone on the panel, um, is have the paper prints that were preserved on 35 been redigitized from the paper sources? Uh, I would say we, yeah, <laughs> I think the answer is yes. But um, is there a big difference in quality between a 2K scan of the paper print or a 35 millimeter preservation made from the paper print? So I guess the, the question is, you know, how do how are these? What's the process? How are these transferred? And um, what are the differences between 2K scan or 35 millimeter preservation? Uh, I can talk a little bit about the basic, you know, initial decision process. Mm -hmm. um, as Tracy kind of alluded to, the, the paper prints are very fragile. Um, there are some that we don't even wind through because we know they're going to break. So it's always uh, preferred to scan. If we've got 35 millimeter preservation from the paper print, we'd like to scan that. If we don't have that, we can scan the Niver 16. Um, again, it's unfortunate that it's a 16 millimeter size image, but if that's what you got, it's something we can easily do and we know it'll survive. Um, so that's usually where we start. If there is some sort of bigger need, um, like someone like Tracy, who's got a plan and an idea, then we can look into um, prepping the paper prints, which goes through a very long process of us um, using special tools and materials to prep the paper roll for scanning. Um, so that is a, a large effort. And um, we are, while we are blessed to have the staff that we have, it's one of those that we all have jobs that uh, we have other roles we need to fill so trying to balance our time between all these projects you know it's it's one of those it's a significant effort so i'm sure david can provide more information <laughs> so there have been many different uh phases of the paper print uh copying and preservation the flicker flashbacks the work was done by linwood dunn who was a special effects expert in hollywood the um, most of the collection, not 100%, was copied to 16 millimeter by uh, Kemp Niver, as Alexis said. And that is what we've been living off of. After Niver stopped doing it, the work moved to Bill Alt, who had worked for Kemp Niver and continued doing the work in 35 millimeter at UCLA. And we also have those copies. Um, we had set up an in-house system to do the copying, which is basically having a digital camera pointing at the uh, a flattened paper print, and found that there were nearly innumerable technical challenges to accomplish both in the capture of the image and being able to put it back into uh, um, you know, a moving picture. So we're currently using a vendor for that, but it's a very expensive process and it doesn't scale up to do 3000 paper prints. So as we have an outside sponsor who's willing to pay for it, we're working with them uh, to have it done. And for access, rather than waiting years and years for everything to be done perfectly, we're look, we've been digitizing under uh, Mike and Sean the uh, existing paper prints. So there are currently 600 titles that have been scanned, uh, speed corrected, um, identifying information added, catalog records created, and those will be going online on loc.gov later this year. And that's that will be our main contribution. And then we also work with outside parties like Tracy or Serge Bromberg who want to uh, sponsor specific titles. One thing to keep in mind is that the, the image resolution of the paper prints is really pretty poor very low resolutions, probably less than 1K resolution. So if you have a biograph negative and a paper print, 
the biograph negative looks stunning. Uh, if you have a paper print and a beat up nitrate print, the nitrate print will look better, but the paper print won't have the damage and splices and other things that the nitrate prints picked up over the years. And then we end up weaving um, bits and pieces uh, together. So there's a um, very famous 1909 biograph called At the Altar, very early use of close-ups. I know you've got time issues where all the exteriors come from the paper prints because the 35 didn't have any of the exteriors and all the interiors are MoMA 35 millimeter. And honestly, once you really work digitally with the, uh, if you get a good scan, it can be pretty darn close. So you don't get that feeling of hopping back and forth between the quality of the images, like you do going between 35 and 16. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That's really great to learn all of that. And I uh, just want to, um, maybe we have time for one last question, or I can combine these two. Um, and also there's a, a, I think Becky Grimm noticed uh, or noted in the chat that the paper print um, was at the National Archives in 43 to 44 with Carl Lewis Gregory working, um, who was a motion picture engineer at NARA um, and orig made original copies on 35 um, as well. So we can add that information um, in as well for 1943 to 44. Um, so the question, there was a question from Joel Lehman and another uh, uh, attendee. Um, how were European film, were, were European films entitled to copyright in the US? Um, for example, Melies or Warwick Trading Company films. Um, could this only be done through an American representative or on American soil? And then another user asked, is there any chance that some of the early British films preserved at paper prints will be restored at high quality? Uh, for instance, those of the brilliant Alf Collins. Okay. Uh, so foreign works have always been eligible for United States copyright. There were some restrictions on books way back when, where they, uh, beyond a couple of copies, they needed to be published by American printers. Uh, that requirement went away maybe 50 years ago. But no, foreign works were read, uh, qualified, whether they were from an American distributor or the foreign distributor. OK. OK, great. So and then, yeah, uh, Zvi from the other panel saying that they, uh, he's a, a lawyer. He said, yes, they were entitled. They had a reciprocal treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, but someone else said not true. They only established it in 1891. Well, luckily that was before. Well, that, that's true. I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for our purposes, that was yeah, and and uh, yeah. So I think that um, it's our our time is up, unfortunately. Um, but we will be 